All right, chapter 73. Now, the writer of this psalms, I think David, or David has been the, the initial writer of most of these psalms, but 73 is ascribed to somebody else. This guy's name is Asaph. Uh, and uh, who, who, is, who is Asaph? Well, let's, let's take a look at who he is for a moment. He was a chief musician in the tabernacle. He was a Levite. Now, there was... Well, you say, well, what, what's a Levite? Maybe probably a lot of you know what a Levite is. But a Levite is from the tribe of Levi. And, and when God was setting up the tabernacle, he chose the tribe of Levi to be the priesthood, to take care of the temple. Uh, and, the, and every facet of that temple, that was their whole job. They weren't allowed to work outside of that. that their job was the temple only. And the rest of the other, the other 11 tribes were to feed them and take care of them as they served God in the temple. So Asaph was a, was a, uh, a, um, a, a Levite uh, and, and responsible there. He was also a very gifted man, obviously, in music. So God used him mightily to, to, sing, to create psalms and songs. David used him often. David loved music of every fashion. Uh, I think Jonathan said, you know, music is, he loves music of every type. But David did. He, he loved every instrument coming down the pike. If you read Psalms 150, uh, you look at all the instruments he used to worship God. Uh, David loved music, uh, and certainly Asaph helped supply that. You know, in, in 2 Chronicles 29, uh, 30, it also that says that uh, Asaph was a seer. And you know what a seer is? He's a prophet, and, and but he, uh, he could not be probably a part of, God had to divinely speak to Asaph in order for him to write this book of Psalm 73, because all scripture is inspired by God, right? <clears throat> so they, this Asaph was a seer. Now, but the thing of it was, Asaph, even back then, he, you know, he, even though he worked in the temple, he, he, was, a, he was a man. He was human. And you're going to see the struggle that Asaph had today. And it may be a struggle that you and I have contended with uh, in our life, uh, especially maybe sometimes the older you get. Uh, you'll see that. Uh, he was uh, David uh, and, and uh, he, uh, King Hezekiah, I'm sorry. He, he was a, great, a good king of Israel. Uh, and and he, all, he used a lot of Asaph and David's psalms uh, to worship God in the temple. So God used him mightily down through the years. He's even continuing to use Asaph because of his, Asaph because of his service to God. So this, this chapter here that we're going to talk about, it, it deals with David's divine providence and, and the internal battle of the human heart. Because, you know, we, we, are, we come from a broken spirit, don't we? Uh, because of Adam, we all have sinned and come, fell short of the glory of God, every one of us. So it, it kinda, this, this chapter deals with that. And it spurts about this journey of self-realization and the evils in the world and remembering God's, and then coming back to remembering God's eternal plan for mankind. So let's go to verse 1. It says there, if you have your Bibles open, uh, Psalm 73, verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Now, <clears throat> Asap begins with this sacred principle, God is good to Israel. And you might ask, well, you know, who is Israel? And, and we always think, well, they, those are the Jewish people, right? Well, they're, they're a part of the Jewish people. They are descendants of Jacob. Uh, if you, do you remember the story about Jacob? He was, uh, he was one of the 12, or he had, the, I mean, he was the father of the 12 uh, tri tribes of Israel. Uh, he was, he was a, a, a bit of a character. He kind of cheated his brother out of the birthright, but God blessed him. God wanted to use Jacob. Uh, and then one day he was traveling in, and, uh, with his whole family, uh, and uh, he sent his family across the, uh, the river, uh, so he could go and worship God, be alone and worship God, and, and ended up wrestling an angel all night long. Uh, I believe it was an angel. Uh, and, uh, and, never, and he obviously gained the victory, he prevailed. 
So it was becoming daylight, and, and uh, Jake, the angel said, let me go. It's, it's daylight. i got to go. And Jacob said, you know, I'll let you go if you bless me. And at that moment, at that moment in time, he said, no longer is your name Jacob. Your name is Israel. And the word Israel means contends or contends with God. <clears throat> so if you look at Israel's history <laughs> down through the years, uh, have they contended with God? Boy, and still today, Israel contends with God. But God chose Jacob. He chose Israel as his chosen people. Those who bless Israel, God will bless. I think we in America need to remember that more than ever. We need to honor Israel because we want God's blessing on us. And, and certainly we need that today. So he opens with this, and he talks about the pure of heart, <clears throat> uh, which refers to basically those that are faithful and devoted to God, as Asaph was. An upright, pure heart is a clean heart that is cleansed by God, and by, God by his truth. So I think Asaph had that, and he understood that completely. But yet he struggled. He struggled. Let's go to verse 2. But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. Now, Aphesap was, um, was, was strongly assaulted here with some type of t- temptation. Because he kind of think, he looked around, and I think sometimes we do this kind of same thing today, even us. Do you ever look around and, and, and maybe see injustice? Uh, in the world, and and wonder how come how come God allows that to happen? How come He lets some of these people do what they do? Exist even. So He's looking around, and I think it's dangerous sometimes when we look around. We need to look within <laughs> more. I think <clears throat> the temptation. His temptation was close to overcoming him. He said he's almost slipped. I, I, when, I, when I read that verse, I kind of had this idea. Anybody acrophobic? <laughs> Fear of heights? <clears throat> yeah, I am too. Uh, I, I never used to be, but I, I, I kind of got that way when I was older. Uh, but I, I got this vision in my head about this, my foot almost slipped, of being on the edge. I've been to the Grand Canyon. You ever been there? Or over someplace where you look straight down, and it's, it, it's just like... It's scary. It's, it, you know, if you slip, you're going you're gonna to fall. You're going to be destroyed. I think that's kind of what Asaph was feeling. He knew if he let his foot slip, that he's going to be destroyed. His faith was going to be destroyed. <clears throat> because he saw something that shook, that shook his faith. He, our faith, his faith in an omniscient, an omnipotent God was shaken. When he looked around. Verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Boom. That's the crux of his problem here. He looked around. He saw the boastful and the prosperity of the wicked. How come, God, how come I'm not rich? How come I don't have what they have? How come I don't look how they look? How come I don't feel... I have all the stuff that they have. He looked around and saw that and said, hey, that's, you know, God, what's, what's fair about this? What, what is fair about it? Envy is a temptation, I think, that you and I, as I said earlier, maybe contend with today. Sometimes unknowingly. Sometimes it can change our behaviors. Envy is a feeling of discontent or resentment, longing, or, long, or longing aroused by someone else's possessions, their qualities or their status or their abilities. We're just envious of others. We want what they have. But you know, God, in his divine order, has given you and I exactly what he wants you and I to have. And then, if we understand that, we can have contentment. But if we're always looking around, always checking out what other people have, discontent. Follows. <clears throat> in Galatians 
chapter 5, verse 21, envy <clears throat> is one of the works of the flesh. And so God says, you know, don't envy. So when we do envy, what would you call that? You call it sin, wouldn't it? Disobedience. God never honors disobedience. He does honor obedience. So God says, do not envy. Be content with what I give you. <clears throat> Galatians 5.17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. <clears throat> they are in conflict with each other. And, uh, Solomon said in Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. It causes harm. You cannot be envious and happy at the same time. It's impossible. <clears throat> Verse 4. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk a minute there further. There's a few examples <clears throat> in the Bible of envious people. Now, there's a lot, actually, but I'm only going to talk about two. And, and you may have heard of, of the, these, these characters. The first of was Cain and Abel. Do you think Cain was envious of Abel? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much so. First, first two siblings couldn't get along because of envy, and Cain killed Abel. Now, another, another one you probably know the story of that we probably heard from kid, kids growing up is uh, Joseph, <clears throat> his coat of many collars. His fa he was favored by his father, Jacob. Uh, what, what caused his demise? Initially, it was his demise, envy. And, and <clears throat> so, but, but it, through God's plan, he used Joseph in a mighty way to save his whole family, didn't he, in, in Egypt. But, <clears throat> but that's just some examples of what envy can do. It can cause a lot of harm. <clears throat> so, you know, not only it said here that uh, they were, he was, I was envious, but uh, he was envious of who? The boastful. Those, and, and, and boastful talks about pride. Anybody deal with pride? Don't, that's rhetorical. Don't answer that. I deal with pride. I just say so you know at times. <laughs> uh, but you know what? Uh, Proverbs sixteen eighteen says this: Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. <clears throat> it seems that those that have more are very proud of what they've accomplished, very content. They show contentment with, with all that they have and very prideful. Well, they're, uh, their contentment is short-lived. Let's go to verse 4. <clears throat> there are no pangs in death, but their strength is firm. Now, it seems that they have no struggles. Did you ever notice that? <clears throat> uh, I don't know, maybe some people contend with a lot of illness and difficulties in their life, and other people just, uh, seem to, that are, that are you know, good, honest, loving, God-loving Christian people, but yet there's ones out there that's just doing, doing wicked, and they never seem to suffer any kind of ailments. <coughs> I think that's what Asaph's talking about here. They, they're, <coughs> they're, they, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. They are. They. They don't. They don't uh, suffer like other people do. Not even in death. But that, my friends, is a delusion. Uh, uh, there was, uh, for an example, when I uh, growing up over home in, in the great metropolis of Brownville, Ohio, uh, <clears throat> population eighty maybe. Uh, <clears throat> but there was a businessman there, and and uh, this guy was very prosperous. Uh, he was a good businessman. He, he really was good. But the one thing you could not talk to him about was God. He, <clears throat> when, if you brought up God, man, he would stop you right now. He wanted nothing to do with God. I don't as far as I know, this man never entered uh, the doorway of a church. He never wanted anything to do with God. <clears throat> but one day, uh, I wasn't there, but my brother was. He was an EMT. Uh, uh, one day, <clears throat> He got a call, and he had to go to this man's house, and he was in the, in the middle of a heart attack. <clears throat> and uh, 
And guess who he was screaming for to help him? The one he rejected all of his life. Probably too late. Now, God could, could God save him? Sure he could have. But the one he rejected, <clears throat> he screamed for him, God help me, God help me. Well, in the news last week or so, he talked about uh, the prosperity of the wicked and their no pain in, in their death. Uh, a couple people, uh, a woman, uh, I, I forget their names, uh, and, and there's another guy, <coughs> huh? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, he was, a, he was a chef or something. And then the girl that sold purses or made purses, or I forget her name too. I'm not a name kind of guy. But anywho, uh, you know, these people were su- prosperous, successful people, weren't they? Look at all they all they had. We, even in Sunday school class, they mentioned, look at all the actors, and all the, you know, all those guys, all the money they make. And, 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 but where's the contentment? It seems that they have everything. It seems that they don't suffer like we suffer. But it's, I, again, it's a delusion. Discontentment rules in their heart. Verse 5. They are not in trouble like other men, nor are they plagued like other men. <clears throat> every individual, every person in this world will experience trouble. Now, some to greater extent than others, and different degrees. <clears throat> John 3, 16, 33 said this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you, me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. Oh, good man. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate that. In this life, you will have tribulation. But, it says, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? We're on the winning team if we know Jesus Christ of our Savior and God as our Father. We're on the winning team. Be of good cheer. One day, we will receive our reward. Maybe not in this life. And maybe. Uh, <clears throat> we kind of observed today some ungodly and self-centered people exempt or untouched by the sorrows and the lots that some of us contend with. I had a brother who uh, served God basically all of his life. Uh, at the age of 43, God took him. Uh, he was a pastor and uh, gave up industry Back to college, uh, became a pastor, lived like a pauper <laughs> all of his, all of, almost all of, his, all of his life until God took him home at age 43. But his reward was not here. It, it was up there. Well, verse 6. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. They, have, they want no other fit ornament to... Uh, to adorn them other than their own vanity. They're boastful, arrogant. They have no, little or no regards for the rights of others. Typically, these people that seemingly prosper. Now, that's, you can't paint everybody with the same brush, but these are a lot of the, are the characteristics of those that have, have, that have prospered in this world but yet reject God. They can be cruel. They can be demanding. They can be ruthless towards other people. They intend to have their own way and achieve it by any means. They clothe themselves in violence. If you've been around much, you've probably seen that in your life. Verse 7. From their callous hearts comes iniquity, wickedness. Their evil imaginations have no limits. Literally, this, this verse in the Hebrew is translated, their eyes bulge with fat. They're just overwhelmed with all the stuff that they have, they just, and they want more, and they just want more. Greed is a big part. They attempt to gratify their lavish lifestyle, but it becomes their tormentor because you can never get enough. It's impossible. Their greed influences every, their thinking, 
and how to achieve their desires by any means. Verse 8, they scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. Uh, they, they threaten oppression. Their mouths, verse 9, their mouths lay uh, claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. They think they are worthy of heaven because of all they have, because of all they've been given. They're proud. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up the waters of abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? That is what the wicked are like. They always are free of care. They go on a, a, amassing wealth. <clears throat> they have, the, the, a lot of times, they have no fear of their very creator. They have no respect for the God of the universe. Yet, God allows them to prosper. Hard to understand sometimes, isn't it? But it's temporal. If I had spoken like that, it would have betrayed the children. I thought to know this, it was too painful to me. Asap realized here that speaking his mind of discontent, as he kind of did, and leaving it there would greatly discourage the followers of God. So it, I, think, I think it's a reminder to us that our words, just as Asap realized, our words have absolute consequences. They leave indelible marks. Only 7% of what we communicate is done by words, but you know what? Words leave indelible marks. We need to be careful what we say uh, and because we can, we can cause more harm than good when we uh, speak hastily. Asap realized that boastful consequences of expressing his anguish, uh, trying to relieve his own anger and discontent, and his resentment of those that profited. But he realized he could not end it here. He could not end his diatribe here without exposing truth. 17, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you're placed, then, placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes, when you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Well, <clears throat> he ended his discouraging thoughts here with a, uh, without declaring that he could not end them without declaring God's truth in the matter. Because if he did, it would have greatly distorted God's truth. Remember in verse 2, he almost slipped. Now God says they, that you put them on slippery ground. There's one that refuse you. Uh, so he shifts his point of view uh, and talks here about God's sovereignty. These wicked that are prosperous flourish for a time, but the problem is they'll be condemned forever. And it forever lasts a lot longer than this temporal life, doesn't it? 21 and 22. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. The sin of self-centeredness and envy will take us to places that we should not go. It'll take us, it'll keep us from longer than we want to stay, and it will cost us more than we want to pay. That's always the price of sin, isn't it? Compared to the omniscience of God, Asaph confessed the futility here of his error, of his thinking. Boy, I'll tell you, you know, Satan cannot attack you and I here if we're a child of God, can he? That's where the Holy Spirit dwells. But he sure can attack you here, and that's what he does very well. We are no challenge for him, but I'll tell you, the earlier I said, be a good cheer, because uh, Jesus has overcome the world. We have hope, folks. I think that's what Asaph is trying to tell folks now through his words. <clears throat> uh, yes, verse 23, yes, I am always with you. You hold me with your right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me to glory. There's our hope, isn't it? Isn't that our hope? Isn't that why we want to live this Christian life, to love God, to serve God? We got, we got a hope of glory one day. And that's forever. That's for eternity. That, my friend, is hope. 
Sin breaks our relationship with God. But when we confess it, doesn't it? He, he forgives and restores us. And in Hebrews 13, 5 says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have. For he himself said, I, he himself, God, will, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Another promise, guys. As a child of God, he will never even though we may leave him at times, he never, ever will leave us. He is our hope. He is our stay. Isn't he? Thank you, God. Well, the word afterward, there it says in verse 24, at the end of this life, we do have eternal hope. After this life. The promise makes it possible for us for us to contend today with maybe the lack of what we have, knowing what, what we're going to gain in, in glory is much greater, isn't it? Verse 25, Whom I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength and of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near to God. <clears throat> I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Asaph learned here the struggle with temptation and envy. And he learned from it. He got victory over it because he understood the truth of God, the hope of God, the necessity of following him in this life, having a pure heart. <clears throat> So he learned that God will never permit his children to experience temptation without enough grace to get through it. But you've got to trust God in that. <clears throat> he learned that grace saves us from harm and allows us to gain by it. So I think Asaph gained by this. If we allow God's grace in our life when we're tempted, we can learn to gain by that lesson that God is teaching us for our good, for our growth. The harm of entertaining, he also learned the harm of entertaining temptation for himself and how it can affect and hurt others. People are watching you and me, aren't they? We say we're Christians. They're watching us. Is your life positive testimony or is it a negative testimony? God knows. It's 12 o'clock. Hmm. <clears throat> I didn't think I was going to have enough information. Okay, but Paul said this. Paul said, uh, <clears throat> not that I speak in respect to want, for I have learned in whatever state, whatever circumstance I am, therewith to be content. Contentment, my folks, my friends. That's what it has to offer. Do you want to live a life of, of success? Do you want to live a life of significance? Sig a life of just simply success is, is, the, is the envy is a product, and I'll be I'll, I'll strive for success. Success in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with success. God gives, allows us success, and He wants us to use our gifts, talents, and abilities. But in and of itself, if our strive, our whole life is about just success, it's very self centered. It will leave you wanting. Life of significance. In closing here, the life of significance is completely different. The life of significance is not about me. It's about others. You know people, I know people, even in this church, that have lived a life of significance. And, it, and if you want to know <clears throat> what kind of life a person lives, if you want to know what kind of legacy they left behind, go to their funeral. Whole different world, isn't it? <clears throat> One that was successful. Oh, they had so much. I, I, one uh, neighbor died that was successful, and, and uh, uh, all that they really had to say positive about him was, boy, he could spin a good yarn. And for you younger people, spin a good yarn means just tell a good joke or tell a good story. <laughs> so that, that's all they could say about him. But I've been to funerals where people have lived that significant life serving God and serving others. Wow, what a difference. People can't say enough. The, the place is uh, K Forbes. Uh, I, I don't want to pick out too many, but I, K, 
I mean, just look at, look at, their, look at their, their legacy when they leave it behind. I'm going to leave it with this. What's going to be your legacy? What are you leaving behind? What are people going to say about you? Is you about you? Or is you about others? Did you live a life of significance? And self-gain? Well, God knows the motives of our hearts, doesn't he? He's the true judge. There's a lot more I have to say about significance and, and, and success, but it, it's, it's time, folks. But I hope you get the picture. What did Asaph really want to say here? What did Asaph really want to say? You know what? I'm a human. I struggle. Just like everybody. It's an example to us because we struggle too, don't we? He's saying, though, you know what? I, 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 I've got the truth of God. I learned. I learned from this envy and this self-pity that I struggle with. I learned that I have hope, that I have glory, that this life is worth it when I spend it on others, when I spend it serving God. Because one day, one day my reward is much greater than those that do choose not to serve God, that reject him. Their, their reward is pain, and misery, and suffering for eternity. In closing, have you chosen to live for God? Have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Do you have that hope of glory one day? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Have you chosen him? Do you know your eternal destination? You can. You can know it today if you haven't. If you have, living that Christian life, serving God, may not be the rewards maybe that you all want here now, but one day, God, when you enter the portals of heaven and God says, well done, and God gives you those crowns and all that stuff that we've earned, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ. We have hope. You have that hope. You can. I'm going to close in prayer. If you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you want to talk to me or Pastor Jonathan, I, please come forward at the, and maybe at the end of the service. We'd love to ch chat with you and talk to you more about it. If you do know Christ, live like a Christian. Let people know. There's, pe there's world, a world dying out there that needs Jesus Christ. That's why we're for the valley. Let's close. Father, I pray now. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior, that God, the Holy Spirit, does his work of redemption in their heart right now. Father, <clears throat> save their soul. God, I just pray, Father, that you would help us in the struggles of our lives. And God, we, we're attacked in many different areas in this life. But Father, help us to seek the truth, to seek you, God, and seek your help. Help us, Father, to follow you. Uh, Father, to live that righteous life, to bless you, God, with our life. And Father, and praise you for all that you do provide for us. So God, be with us now. Guide us this week. Protect us from the evil one. God, and use us mightily for your eternal purpose. God, I give you the praise for your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, hey, as we close the service, I want to just thank you, Wayne, for, for teaching us this morning. It's a blessing. Um, you know, as, uh, as that psalm ended... It said, I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of your works. And, you know, that's, that's really what we're called to do. Um, and so as we go from here, as, as we've been doing this series, every single psalm we're, we're, we're singing it musically as they were meant to be. Um, and uh, this is a song that I want you to listen to. I didn't write it. Um, a guy named Tommy Prophet. Check him out on YouTube. Awesome guy. Uh, he has written some, some songs that uh, we've, we're doing two of them in this series. But uh, he wrote this song called I'd Rather Have You, and it's based on Psalm 73. And so uh, we want to just sing it together, and um, in, in that way we're going to close our service. So I'm getting a signal there, Matthew? Mountains, they will fall, riches they will cease, treasure of this
this world buried with their kings this is not my home filled with pride and greed Jesus you I'd rather have you forgive my desires, forgive every motive, forgive my intentions, cause I'd rather have you if it's not your will, God. I don't even want it. And now I surrender, cause I'd rather have God, thank you for these words that we can express to you. Lord, they are our, they're our declaration, God, to you. Lord, change our hearts, change our motive, change our attitude when it comes to this life. Help us to see that prospering in the world's eyes is not prospering in eternity's eyes. Lord, help us to cling, to hold fast to you. We love you, and we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.